It started as a simple question, but became one of Silicon Valley's great success stories. It's become in some ways the, the pulse of the internet. It's a siren for freedom. We don't like censorship. We don't like being blocked. We think that the open exchange of information can have a positive global impact. A politician's bullhorn and a cyber red carpet for celebrities reaching out to their fans. To be a successful startup, you need two fundamental things. You need great founders and you need a great opportunity. Blogging pioneer Evan Williams with Biz Stone and original inventor Jack Dorsey found that opportunity in Twitter which has grown to over 175 million registered users who tweet an average of 95 million times a day. It has traveled everywhere, but the flight was not always smooth. Some pretty dark times and a lot of entrepreneurs would have quit. It's really a brand new communications platform in its infancy and yet it's already scaled to several hundred million users. It's here to stay and I think it's going to continue to change the world. Welcome and hello. We're here to talk about Twitter. Ow. T-W-T-T-R. Twitter. The product is a short burst of information, 140 characters or less, called a tweet. If you still aren't clear what exactly that is or why it's important, you're in good company. Even Russian President Dmitry Medvedev needed a little help. I'm now in Twitter, and this is my first message. It wasn't just his first tweet. It's a sign of Twitter's global influence that it was also his first stop on his first trip to the United States. Twitter was started by these three men, Evan Williams, Biz Stone, and Jack Dorsey. At the end of 2010, a round of funding valued the company at $3.7 billion. Tim O'Reilly is a publisher and trend spotter in the world of technology. These guys did something not because they knew exactly where it was going to go, but because they thought it was a good thing in and of itself. Those are, I think, often the real game changers. Twitter's co-founder is blogging trailblazer Evan Williams. The best and worst of Evan are two sides of the same coin. Mike Maples is the founder and managing partner of the venture capital firm Floodgate, an early investor in Twitter. I think he's stubborn in the pursuit of the ideas he cares about. But the thing that I've come to appreciate over time is he is driven by that belief. The son of a farmer, Williams was born in 1972 and raised on the family farm near Clarks, Nebraska. Meg Hurahan has known Williams since the late 90s. He was the third of four children and his dad and his father like going hunting and Evan's a vegan. So I think that's kind of the sense of how he fit in in rural Nebraska. There's not a lot of soy drinking vegans on the farms near where he grew up. Williams' passion wasn't farming. It was web design and programming. After a year and a half at the University of Nebraska, he dropped out and drifted from various technology jobs and startups. I started my first internet company in Nebraska in 1994, which required first explaining what the internet was. <laughs> Ohm Malik is the founder of technology blog GigaOhm and has been writing about the web for over a decade. You don't go to school to be an entrepreneur. You either have it or you don't, right? And F seems to have it. Right? Like you're born with this. The, the skill to see opportunities is innate. It's in your DNA. And I think F belongs to that category of people who just know what is happening. He took that entrepreneurial spirit west to the mecca for technology geeks, Northern California. His first job there was working for Tim O'Reilly. He always had opinions about how things could be better. He wasn't satisfied with the status quo. Ev was not shy about letting us know what he thought wasn't working and how we could do a better job. Within a year, Williams moved on to writing computer code as an independent contractor for companies like Intel and Hewlett Packard. In San Francisco, he teamed up with software contractor Meg Hurahan. My very, very first impression was he was kind of dorky because he had just gotten this keyboard to put his Palm Pilot on, and it was like an external keyboard you could mount the Palm Pilot on, and he was like, kind of excited that he had just gotten his keyboard. They became a couple and started a company together, Pyra Labs. This is my desk, very messy. When we started Pyra, it was 1999. It was right in the height of the dot-com boom. It was a really exciting time to be in, in San Francisco. 
Kyra Labs product was a web program designed to manage projects, keep track of to-do lists, and assemble contacts. One small feature was a Williams-invented tool to make it easy to update an online personal journal, at the time known as a weblog. And then as a joke, a friend of ours sort of decided he wasn't going to call it weblog, he was going to call it blog. Williams saw a new product. Evan's really good with names and branding and stuff. He said, we should call it Blogger. Blogger.com became a sensation. Really couldn't believe it. You know, every day there would be more traffic on the website, more users signing up, and you would say, well, this has got to be it. It can't possibly continue at this rate. And the next day there'd be more people. Ryan Single is a staff writer at Wired.com. Nobody really knew what blogs were, right? This was a, kind of a new thing. He had had this idea he wanted a, an easy way to publish online, write an article, uh, write something short about their lives, and publish it. And this was, this was a new phenomenon. Blogging was this brilliant additional layer that made it possible for somebody to work just with the content, just with the images. They didn't have to do anything technical. So it really made the web, uh, the web for everyone. But the big idea from the small startup wasn't enough to keep it afloat. It then hit an iceberg. The market crash of 2000 spelled disaster for many in Silicon Valley. People were panicked, dot com started to fail. We weren't prepared for how quickly everything would really kind of shut down. The Byron headquarters. We ran out of money. I left because I was tremendously stressed and freaked out and like five figures in debt and the business relationship between myself and Evan was totally frayed and horrible. Evan kind of closed up shop and took the servers back to his apartment and hunkered down to to sort of ride out the storm. The post dot com boom was was ugly in, in, in San Francisco. You had this whole group of people who thought they were getting on the train to riches who then all of a sudden had to figure out what exactly they wanted to do with their life. Williams posted to his blog that he was now blogger's only employee. It went through some pretty dark times and a lot of entrepreneurs would have quit, but Ev stuck with it. When you're a great entrepreneur, you have to you have to be willing to try a few things. And so if you don't love it, when you encounter fierce resistance or stupidity or the inertia that the world throws in front of you, you're going to give up. You won't persevere. But if you truly love an idea, you'll be so convinced that you're right and that the rest of the world is wrong and just watch me, that you'll just keep plugging away at it and that'll be what sustains you. Evan Williams was running Blogger.com by himself. The company was struggling, barely surviving the dot-com bust. He had nothing but a great idea. When he got a call from an industry giant, he called his former partner, Meg Hurahan, with the news. And he said, are you sitting down? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, no, really, are you sitting down? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I'm sitting. He said, we've agreed to be acquired by Google. The amount of the sale was never disclosed. It's like playing in like, you know, a, a double A league and then all of a sudden like you get a call from the Yankees and they're like, you know, I want you to come play in the playoffs. Google was huge and they were cool and they were going places. That's got to be pretty amazing, right? I mean, it's just got to be, oh, wow, like, I've hit the big time. Google was going places and Williams was going with them. He went to work developing blogger.com for the exploding search giant. During this time, his future business partner, Biz Stone, was 3,000 miles away on the East Coast, working as a creative director at a competing blogging website called Zanga.com. Stone jumped on the blogging bandwagon. Lou Kerner is vice president of social media research at Wedbush Securities. Young kids in particular, they start all of the social media revolutions, and they were the early entrance into blogging, just blogging about their lives, and Zanga uh, provided one of the early platforms for kids to do that. Stone grew frustrated with the direction of Zanga. He moved to Los Angeles in 2001 and wrote two books on blogging. For Stone, Google also came calling and hired him to help them develop their new acquisition, blogger.com. Here is where Twitter's two future business partners first met. In 1999, Evan and I were basically rival, had rival companies. And uh, <laughs> Ev sent me a note that says, how about you come work here for me? So the first time we actually met was when he picked me up at the airport to take me to work. But their time at the company was limited. After less than two years at Google, Williams walked away in October of 2004. 
he had never really gone to work for anyone or worked at a company. He's an inventor. He's an entrepreneur. He's not one to probably, you know, want to have bosses or managers or work really within a structure. You know, he wants to be able to build the things that occur to him when they occur to him. By the end of 2004, Williams wrote a business plan for a new internet startup called Odeo, a podcasting company that would distribute and publish audio on the web. He raised $5 million from some of the biggest names in angel money and venture capital, including Google backer Ron Conway, Lotus founder Mitch Kapoor, and his old boss, O'Reilly media chief Tim O'Reilly. Ever having had a success with Blogger, I uh, found it relatively easy to raise angel money and VC money around the idea that, that podcasting uh, was going to become a next generation of blogging. Stone left Google and joined Williams at Odeo. But the young company suffered a devastating blow. Odeo hit a glass wall named Apple. Mike Maples invested $25,000 in Odeo. We were going to take podcasting to the masses. Well, a week after he gets my check, Apple gives podcasting away on iTunes. And when you're giving podcasting away and all of the playback devices are iPods, it's not clear there is a business anymore. Within six months of starting the podcasting company Odeo, Evan Williams' reputation as a Silicon Valley success story was taking a hit. Thanks to Apple's iTunes, Odeo's web music distribution venture was dead in the water. And by the end of 2005, everyone in Silicon Valley knew it. I didn't really think much of Odeo. I just didn't. I thought the idea of a podcasting company was just quite marginal. I never quite believed Odeo was the right fit for Evan because the podcasting model didn't seem to align well with his passions. While the company's prospects looked dim, there was help on the horizon. Enter Jack Dorsey. In 2005, Dorsey was running his own startup. A map fanatic and self-proclaimed computer geek, he was consumed with perfecting software systems for sending or dispatching messages instantly. For 911 emergency centers and couriers and taxis and whatnot, the concept that came out of this was this very simple, here's where I am, here's what I'm doing, anyone who's interested can follow along in real time. For years, Dorsey had been looking to explore the potential of a dispatch system that could help friends stay connected. After a chance encounter with Williams, he thought he saw his opportunity. At that point, I needed to get a, a real job and write a resume, and I'm a very low-level programmer, and I've always loved that, that aspect, but I wanted to do something different, and I had read about Ev from his success at Blogger. Over lunch at this children's playground, the idea for Twitter was hatched. Dom Segola, then a software engineer at Odeo, was at the meeting. We climbed to the top of the slide and sat down and started eating. Um, and Jack couldn't contain himself. He had to describe the idea right off the bat. The simplest thing that we can do is for me to be able to send out a message from my phone and have other people to be able to, to read it in real time. This idea that we'd have a friendship dispatch for important information, non-emergency information, uh, to your friends and family. Dorsey pressed Williams to let him try it, saying, Let's just do that. It's so simple to program. We could do it maybe in two days. Williams gave him two weeks. Dorsey asked Biz Stone to help develop the graphics and visual elements. Two weeks later, they had something. We built a system to immediately take a message. So you could have a $20 Nokia phone send a message that I'm in the middle of Central Park in New York City watching the geese pass by on the lake, and it would go out instantly to all your friends in real time. On March 21st, 2006, Dorsey sent the first message. The product worked, but the friendship dispatch system needed a catchier name. Noah Glass, a co-founder of Odeo, scoured the Oxford English Dictionary and came across Twitter short bursts of information or tweets from birds it was the most perfect thing because it's exactly what we were doing williams bought out of odeo forming a new company which became twitter in april of 2007 the move cost him two million dollars evan said to me literally we just don't think we have a business here and rather than just spend all of your money and try to come up with something new or keep the plate spinning i'm just going to give you your money back 
And in fact, a lot of the people that I invested in Odeo with took their money back and chose not to invest in Twitter. And Twitter is the investment, by the way, where if you passed on it, it mocks you every day. Evan Williams was chairman of the board. Biz Stone was creative director. And the soft-spoken Jack Dorsey was Twitter's first CEO. It was this music festival that helped Twitter really take off. In 2007, at the annual South by Southwest Music and Technology Festival in Austin, Texas, Twitter broke out with the public. And the winner is, you can check your cell phones, Twitter. Yeah! I would like to thank everyone in 140 characters or less. And I just did. <laughs> we rented two screens and we put them in the hallways. And they would show what people were saying about South by Southwest. When we saw Twitter operating in the wild for the first time at this festival, we witnessed people moving together as one, and we lifted this idea out of a fun, geeky festival. What if this were in other events around the world? Twitter had met its tipping point. During the festival, usage tripled from 20,000 tweets a day to 60,000 tweets a day. Twitter just showed up in the world at a time when there was a demographic shift in how computing was being used, when computers were no longer productivity tools, but social tools that enabled expression. It quickly became a vehicle for sharing what am I reading now, what am I thinking now, where am I now, who am I seeing now. But Williams and his team weren't prepared for how many people wanted to share. As Williams later told Charlie Rose. Some have suggested for a, prob for a while there, maybe still, you had a problem with crashing because there was so much usage. We did. We had a terrible first year and a half, actually, where the site went down a lot and was slow a lot. And it took us a long time to get out of that. That almost, that almost killed us, I think. With Twitter experiencing growing pains, Williams blogged that the company needed a more focused approach from a single leader. Original inventor Dorsey stepped down as CEO and Williams took over. Twitter found itself on everyone's radar, and that included one very interested potential competitor. It was kind of looking like Facebook was going to be pushed off to the side. Twitter was an international sensation. In one year alone, subscribers to the social networking and microblogging site grew more than a staggering 1,300%. What do you think about all the attention here on Twitter? What's this attention? <laughs> that got the attention of Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg. The sense I get is that Mark Zuckerberg probably has a vision for where he wants to take Facebook, and he probably looked down the road and saw Twitter on that road to achieving his vision. Zuckerberg tried to acquire Twitter. Business Week reported he had offered $500 million worth of cash and Facebook stock, which CEO Evan Williams turned down. We thought about it carefully, and I, I can't say, you know, offers are in various forms of seriousness, right, and sure. who knows yeah. if, you know, they would have done it, but our analysis was... Carefully considered, we're, we're a, you know, a for-profit company. We have outside investors. They have to look at these deals. But I never felt like it was the best thing for Twitter. The potential is so great that to stop now, even at a, you know, a big win financially, would just feel like a loss. By 2008, users were posting 300,000 tweets per day. Users that included Oprah Winfrey. When Oprah tweeted, Oprah introduced Twitter to tens of millions of people who had never even heard of Twitter before. So it was great free advertising for Twitter. And it didn't stop there. Being on Oprah wasn't as important as the State Department asking Twitter to not go on its daily maintenance because the Iranian elections were being broadcast on Twitter. Following allegations of fraud in the 2009 Iranian election, protesters took to the streets. Authorities in the country censored cell phone messages, newspapers, and websites that covered the increasingly violent protests. 
eclipsing traditional and mainstream news, Twitter became the outside world's primary source for information on Iran. We don't like censorship. We don't like being blocked. We think that the open exchange of information can have a positive global impact. We've always been pro-information sharing, democratization of information, and, you know, more information is better. Twitter really got global attention from how its communications platform was able to spread news about what otherwise probably, you know, most people on the planet wouldn't have heard about. Even when we're blocked in a country, we still see traffic, and it's because smart folks in that country are figuring out ways to get around those blocks. By the end of 2009, the number of tweets went up to two and a half million per day. But Stephen Colbert was not impressed. My guest tonight is the co-founder of Twitter. What's Why that? 140 characters? Was, was texting too complex? I mean, what? <laughs> the limit on texts are 160 characters. Uh -huh. We wanted to reserve a little bit of room for our username, mm -hmm. and so we made it 140 and standardized there. And you'd be surprised at the creativity. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was talking about Twitter, but one big question still dogged the founders. How are you going to make money? You know, it's like, I don't think Ed Williams and Bistone could walk down the street without somebody just sort of whispering, how are you going to make money? Can you give us an outlook for the rest of the year? At Twitter's first developer conference in April of 2010, the Twitter founders finally introduced a plan for how the company might make money. We expect the ad program to be the promoted tweets that we're launching, or we just launched this week, to certainly be the largest part um, in, in a few months, but it's going to take a while to ramp up. Promoted tweets uh, allow people to, in a transparent way, put marketing messages in front of people who, who follow Twitter streams. And it'll be interesting to see how it works. I think that the company knows that it's a work in progress. Five months later, Twitter began rolling out a major redesign of its website, saying they wanted to make it faster and easier to use. Three weeks later came a bigger announcement. Evan Williams was stepping down as CEO of the company. Replacing him as CEO would be former chief operating officer Dick Costello. We're growing at uh, just a ridiculous rate. You know, having been, having run a, a few other companies and, and having spent a couple of years at Google, the pace of growth that we see is just, you know, I've never seen anything like it. To Costolo, long time known quantity in Silicon Valley, the operations guy. Even though he's chief executive officer, he's really still the operations guy. Evans, uh, he's an idea guy, but he's not a CEO kind of a guy. William said he asked Costolo to take the job so he could be completely focused on product strategy. One simple question, what's happening? is transforming how we communicate. By the end of 2010, a round of funding valued Twitter's worth at $3.7 billion, with reports just months later that it had grown even more. Twitter remains a favorite of celebrities like Lady Gaga, who is the most followed person on Twitter. Justin Bieber runs a close second. The State Department has recognized its reach and is now using it as a modern-day voice of America. Twitter is having an impact on world history. There just aren't very many companies that do that. There aren't very many companies that change democracy, that change expression, that change media. There's no question that Twitter uh, is becoming part of the fabric of our society, a way that people communicate, a way that news is disseminated. It's the Twittering of birds, that communication that we don't really know the meaning of, and yet it is profoundly important.